So, welcome everyone. Um, I will be presenting the first seminar of our project. Uh, the seminar is entitled An Introduction to the Evolution of Human Rights, Celebrating the Inclusion of Environmental Rights. It's uh, actually the, uh, first, uh, the first seminar of a three-year project uh, entitled the Human Rights and the Environment in the EU Towards an Inclusive Debate. Uh, it's co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the EU, and it's uh, convened by the Trans Transdisciplinary Institute for Environmental and Social Studies in collaboration with uh, a group of uh, uh, academic researchers. The three-year project will uh, 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 attempt five different thematic areas. The first one that uh, is uh, referring to this seminar is the fundamental right to the environment. Uh, the second thematic area is human rights and uh, biodiversity, human rights and climate change, intergenerational rights and challenges in practice. These are the thematic areas that will be uh, the, the, the seminars that will follow after this one. Today, this uh, particular seminar is split into two parts. The first part that uh, I will be presenting uh, will introduce the notion, the historical development and the current human rights framework, while the second part that uh, Elsa will be presenting after this presentation will introduce the current legal and policy framework on environmental rights. Now, in order to introduce the evolution of human rights, we have come up uh, with uh, this uh, report, this publication. Uh, this, uh, the one that I'm gonna present today is the first part of this report. It will be concluded upon the project's, project's completion that uh, will be in a couple of years time uh, with its second part. And it will remain in draft form until uh, then. It will uh, eventually include uh, a critical analysis of ideas that will surface during the project's duration. The, the main aim of uh, this uh, first part, the, the, the evolution of the human rights framework that I'm going to present on is to portray the dynamic character of human rights by their evolution and development. And the objectives, uh, when we started the project, our initial objective was to analyze why environmental rights should be incorporated in the human rights framework. Uh, thankfully, thankfully, after the 8th of October of 2021, that's approximately four months ago, we can go a step further. Uh, on that date, the UN Human Rights Council adopted the Resolution 4813, which uh, I quote, recognizes the right to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment as a human right that is important for the enjoy enjoyment of human rights. This is an important, policy, uh, important uh, development from a policy perspective. Uh, but it doesn't essentially change the fact that all dimensions of environmental rights need to be thoroughly analyzed. Uh, in order to do that, we need to broaden the knowledge base and bring the two communities together. Uh, what I mean is that in order to understand and promote environmental rights, we will need the environmental community to have a general, solid, general understanding of uh, the human rights framework and vice versa. Uh, so this presentation uh, aims to increase that mutual general understanding. So let's move on to the main part of the presentation. In the report starts, starts with a general introduction of the notion of human rights. I will go a little bit fast on this part of the presentation. It's not particularly important. There are some uh, definitions here, definition of human, of what human is from the Merriam-Webster dictionary, a definition of rights, interestingly from the Stafford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. And then we combine those two uh, things to uh, those two definitions to come up with the definition of human rights. Of course, we wish that things were so simple. The problem mainly lies, of course, with the definition of the term rights rather than the, of the term humans. But uh, in uh, any way, um, let's say that in, the, in, 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 in this particular uh, instance that the concept is relatively new uh, for humanity, especially in its universal application, uh, as rights applied to everyone without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, or any other distinction. Uh, one can obviously uh, look at uh, the vast part, vast majority of uh, uh, human history and see that, the, for example, the ethical or legal acceptance of slavery or separation of rights of women indicate that uh, the universal application of human rights is a relatively uh, um, new idea. Um, before I start with the evolution of rights, I will briefly address some inherent problems in such, uh, such attempts, such efforts. 
The first is the multidisciplinary requirements. The whole discussion involves uh, 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 entails uh, environmental, legal, social, and economic aspects. Uh, also, philosophy, history, and uh, of course, political sciences are important. Uh, it is an increasingly, increasingly complex environment, and of course, nobody can master all, all of, no, nobody can master all of these uh, disciplines. Um, however, uh, it is important to bear in mind that a basic uh, understanding of all of these is important in order to be able to address these issues. The second is, of course, the literature lab with uh, human rights are very, very important uh, nowadays. So uh, basically every development of the human rights come on the concept and framework comes up with its own detailed literature. Detailed literature exists for every era, for every event, for every narrative. And uh, this report does not, uh, is not inclusive. Yeah? It does not include, it does not discuss all historical developments. It just provides a distilled history of the human rights development, aiming uh, to introduce it to the non-expert reader and then maybe uh, promote further study. The third problem that uh, uh, I point here is Wiggishness. The term Whig history and its derivatives is more familiar among, among historians. It's, uh, it was coined in 1931 and it, uh, by, by, by the historian Herbert Butterfield, and it's used to describe uh, historic nar narratives that analyze the past with reference to the present, cautioning against oversimplified narratives. I'm not going to go uh, too much into this, but uh, as you can see in the report, especially when the report is concluded, we do concede to a certain degree of weakness uh, for good reasons. So let's move on. Historical development of human rights. Yeah, how did we get there? The report starts with a basic uh, overview of the world's religions and ancient sources as uh, precursors of human rights. Uh, on the pictures here on the left hand side, you can see the Charter of Cyrus or Cyrus Silinger, which is considered by some as the first human rights documents in uh, history. Of course, other researchers, which probably more close to the accurate uh, depiction of reality, consider this uh, as an anachronistic interpretation or, an, or as an exaggeration. On the right hand side, uh, it's the uh, one of the edicts of Azoka. They are a collection of inscriptions scattered around the re region of today's India, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Pakistan. And they include a set of laws uh, against religious discrimination and also promoting tolerance. Uh, moving forward, uh, we can see uh, deriving from ancient philosophy, the stoic moment was, is considered by many as very important uh, for the human rights framework. Uh, it is wild, widely regarded as a precursor of the theory of natural law, uh, where all people have inherent uh, rights under a natural uh, uh, law compared to them, not by legislation, but uh, by depending on who you ask, God, uh, nature, or reason. Um, and the researchers find that the stoic ideas on human dignity and moral equity, freedom, justice, and brotherhood are important in, uh, in that respect. Um, the stoic cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism in, is uh, underscored in that respect. The term itself uh, is not derived from other stoics. The cynic philosopher Diogenes, who is uh, also in the picture on the right-hand side, is uh, uh, attributed with coining the term when he was asked where he was from. Moving on, uh, there was a big gap in, uh, in, um, in this development of, uh, of thought, uh, a gap uh, that started from the Roman, uh, the Roman ages. I will go a little bit back from this one. Uh, the, stoic, the Stoic teaching did survive the political collapse of the ancient Greek world. It, uh, it was a most influential in the, in, the, in the Roman world as well, including uh, the, world, uh, the works of Zeno or Cicero, um, and then the late Stoa with the, 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 last, uh, the last phase of ancient Stoicism with uh, Seneca or Epictetus or, or Marcus Aurelius. Um, but then after uh, there was a gap of um, let's say let's say thousand years for stoic uh, thinking to resurface. Uh, now I will quote uh, Bertrand Russell and his uh, history of Western philosophy here, uh, saying that 
in the year 529, the academy, Plato's academy, was closed by Justinian because of his religious bigotry and the dark ages descended upon Europe. Stoic thought would have to wait a thousand years to resurface. In the meantime, of course, we had uh, developments in the Middle Ages. Uh, the most important of which are charters codifying rights and freedoms, which uh, address specific rights of particular groups of people that uh, they could uh, claim under specific circumstances. They stemmed from power of use on behalf of monarchs. Um, on the right-hand side, we have maybe the most famous one, the Magna Carta, which was essentially a peace treaty between the King of England, King John then, and the rebel barons. Uh, and it is uh, widely considered as uh, a significantly advanced the development of uh, constitutional law, in, uh, at least in the English-speaking world. Um, the, the most important probably, I mean, it's a medieval text uh, full of medieval grievances against the king. The most important clause is probably the 39th clause, which establishes that everyone, including the rulers, are subject to the law. Uh, other, other similar um, uh, codification or codifications of rights include uh, the Hungary's Golden Bull or the Danish Hand Festings, which all of them, all these uh, medieval cultures reflect rights which are compared to specific groups of people by virtue of their rank of, or status. Now, going towards an all-encompassing philosophical concept of individual liberty, we would have to wait uh, quite a lot longer, quite a few centuries more. Now, most researchers agree that at some point, most point towards the 17th century, there was a radical transition from an older doctrine of natural law that imposed mainly obligations towards a modern concept of rights that focused on the self-assertion of the individual. Now, that distinction was definitely there in the times of Hobbes uh, when he was writing in 1651. This is a, a passage from the one his most well-known work, the Leviathan. You can see that the distinction between right and law is very, very uh, obvious. For those that they speak of this subject used to confound right and law, yet they ought to be distinguished because right consists of the liberty to do or to forbear, where law determines and is binded to one of them. So law and right differ as much as obligation and liberty. Now, more, more recently, during the ending of the 20th century, uh, a group of researchers point towards uh, earlier um, uh, in, the mid, in the Middle Ages, uh, starting from the 12th century, um, pointing to the canonists that uh, did um, derive a more subjective uh, approach to human rights. In the picture, in the left-hand side picture, um, is William of Ockham. Uh, he is considered by some, uh, he, he, he's an interesting figure. You can uh, read the report and find out more about it. But uh, the scholastic philosopher, also Francis Can uh, Fryer, was uh, quite important and uh, an interesting uh, story uh, arises with the dispute in, uh, in, the, in the 14th century between the Catholic Church and the Francis Can Order, which is interesting to our uh, notion of the development of the human rights framework because it was mainly mainly on ownership rights. Yeah. Uh, so uh, moving on, these theoretical discussions soon uh, had practical applications, and the first practical applications were after the discovery of America. This is a map of the voyages of discovery to America from uh, 1492, the first voyage of Columbus. To 1611, you see plenty of them. Uh, the problem that arose, of course, was whether these uh, indigenous peoples in, in, in the Americas uh, would uh, also be entitled to uh, natural rights, or whether these natural rights would be uh, uh, only restricted to quote unquote uh, civilized peoples. Uh, the debate in the debate, um, uh, well known is uh, the contribution of uh, Bartolome de las Casas. And of course, he had uh, his uh, adversaries as well. Um, famous is the Valladolid debate with his main adversary, Juan Ginés de Sepúlveda, that was by the mid uh, 16th century. But by that time, uh, philosophy was really evolving. Unconstrained from theology, it would challenge all theories, it 
to, it would come up with new ones. The power of our rulers was challenged. Uh, the legitimacy of absolute monarchs was also challenged. And um, it was all, uh, there was an increasing call for individual freedom, freedoms. In order to address those things, the report goes through uh, some of the work of um, Thomas Hobbes that we already uh, referred to. I will, I will skip this, uh, this part. Uh, the interested reader can, can, can see in the report what uh, is going on. I will just say that Hobbes uh, on the Leviathan, which is famous for other things rather than the human rights approach, uh, was probably not very popular on either side of the block. His uh, practical uh, goals in the Leviathan, I hope that you're familiar with uh, the work of the Leviathan. It uh, mainly contests that uh, while individuals are endowed with natural rights, uh, they uh, can do whatever to ensure their self-preservation, which leads basically to conflict, fear, war, and so they need uh, the ruler to ensure safety. So this kind of uh, thinking, of course, was not very popular among uh, those uh, who were interested in uh, checking the limits of authority and individual rights, but equally, it was not very appealing to those um, that were afraid that uh, these uh, notions of inalienable rights would, would be used against the sitting ruler. So it's fair to say that uh, Hobbes was not very popular in, uh, by any of those groups at the time. A different approach was, uh, of course, by John Locke, very popular approach. It's also quite uh, analytically presented uh, in, uh, in the report. Uh, I will also not spend much time here as developments in the, 20th, in the more recent times are probably more interesting than uh, for this short presentation. Um, but I will say that the 17th century was definitely a turning point in this evolution of uh, human rights. The age of enlightenment had already started. Um, it was um, all the building, building blocks were already there. Descartes uh, had already uh, uh, declared his uh, famous, I think, therefore I am. Maybe even more importantly, Spinoza had silenced that uh, view like 30 years later. This is all the, in the 17th century. And according to uh, some researchers, we can identify here two distinct lights of enlightenment, moderate variety, which seeks to find the middle ground between the reform claims and the traditional power structure, and a more radical one, which advocates democracy, individual liberty, freedom of expression, and eradication of religious authority. Um, in any case, the rich theoretical discussion would bring on the 18th, 18th century, which is widely uh, considered as the century of rights. Towards the end of that century, the 18th century, a wave of a revolution uh, swept the old order of things. And for our uh, storytelling, for our story of development of human rights, both of the American Revolution and the French Revolution are hugely important. Regarding the American Revolution, I'm not going into details about this. Uh, in the, the report focuses mainly on the Virginian Declaration of Rights, which, which was the first Declaration of Rights uh, uh, less than a month prior to the American Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence itself, with uh, its famous preambular part that we hold this truth, truth to be self-evident that all men are created equal, equal uh, with certain unalienable rights, etc. And then uh, we have the story of the US Constitution, which did not include any reference on rights. And then the first 10 amendments a few years later, which constitute the Bill of Rights and are a very important uh, development. Uh, in the right hand side of uh, this slide, uh, I would chose uh, George Mason. Uh, George Mason, Virginia politician, was very influential in the development of this framework. He was probably, he's probably not as well known as uh, his. Uh, other Virginia colleagues that hold the iconic status of founding fathers for the US, like for example, George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or James Madison, which were the fourth, third and fourth president of the US. Um, George Mason never was president of the US. He was very influential though. He was the main author of the Virginia Declaration of Rights. He was one of the three delegates in the Constitutional Convention of uh, 1887, uh, who refused to sign the constitution exactly because it didn't contain uh, a bill of rights. And the statute itself is quite interesting, interesting because it shows us a little bit of the evolution of ideas, not the statute itself, but the books in the uh, accompanying the statute. 
the book that uh, Mason is holding on his hands is uh, Cicero's The Offices. Cicero is the, the Stoic philosopher we discussed in the beginning. The two books next to him, uh, one is uh, John Locke, uh, The Conduct of the Understanding, and the other one is uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau on the social conduct, which we didn't, didn't discuss, but of course it's, it's crucial on the development of uh, the framework as well. In any case, the events were very dense in that uh, historical period when uh, the amendments to the US Constitution were uh, put forth by Madison. Uh, at that less than a month later, uh, all focus down to France, a state prison on the east side of Paris, uh, was stormed by the mob. As you can see in the depiction here, the, the Prison was basically a royal fortress. It was of limited practical use of the time. Still, the storming of the Bastille was on one of the most symbolic moments of the French Revolution. When uh, Louis XVI uh, heard about the storming of the Bastille, he famously asked uh, a duke that was accompanying, accompanying him at the time, Duke de la Rochefoucauld, uh, if this is a revolt. Is it a revolt, he asked. And then the duke replied famously, no, sire, it is a revolution. The iconic year of the first revolution, of course, is 1789. It's also iconic for the human rights development framework that we are discussing. The most important moment is without, uh, without doubt the adoption of the French Declaration of the Rights of the Man uh, and the Citizen. The declaration marks the beginning of the new political era and constitutes a reference, a reference text around the world in subsequent centuries. It contains 17 articles and it was adopted less than six weeks after the storming of the Bastille. I'm not going into too much detail. I hope most of you are familiar with uh, the content of the declaration, but I will say that um, it does include the basic principles so that every, every person is uh, born free and equal in rights. It includes liberty, property, security, resistance to operations, national sovereignty, and other principles of law, including that everyone uh, is innocent until just um, guilty. Um, Following that, the, the report does not, of course, follow the, the path of the French Revolution. It's not interesting in, in our storytelling, in our discussion. Um, the French Revolution did follow its path. Um, a coalition of uh, European monarchies fought against it. Uh, then it was Napoleon. Uh, of course, before that, it was the guillotines that attracted public imagination, including the beheading of Louis XVI. Uh, uh, that was all considerably later. It was in 1793. What I would like to underscore, though, is that nowhere were discussions on rights more explicit, more divisive, or more influential than uh, in the revolutionary France in the 1790s. The revolutionary councils did lead to a break, a break with the past. They gave birth to a new mentality, a new time conscience, a new concept of political practice, a new notion of legitimization, and an understanding of polit political practice in terms of self-determination and self-realization. Nevertheless, if, as it's obvious, not even uh, revolutionary wars could change everything in the past. Um, the, uh, there was intense, uh, both, theoretic, both theoretical and practical uh, opposition to the new ideas. Uh, in uh, the theoretical world, a year after the uh, the adoption of the declaration, the first declaration, Edmund Burke was offering the first attack, the first, the first uh, conservative critique on the French Revolution. The declaration itself, he saw it as, I quote, a mine that will blow up at one great grand explosion, all examples of antiquity, all precedents, all charters and acts of parliament. Of course, uh, criticism was also attracted from different uh, sides of the philosophical spectrum. For example, quite famous is the critique by Jeremy Bedham, his utilitarian critique, uh, uh, famous his, uh, uh, his phrase that uh, uh, rights are nonsense, nonsense upon stilts. Uh, he was worried that abstract declarations would uh, replace positive law, of course. This is a different story that um, I will not focus upon now. And on the other side, we had uh, uh, the rebuttal by one of the most famous, one of the most, uh, the best, best selling ones was by um, 
Edmund Burke, his uh, attack on the French, uh, his uh, answer, answer to Mr. Burke's attack on the French, French Revolution by Thomas Paine. Uh, then the report addresses two main uh, groups that were excluded by these declarations, women on the one hand, and of course, uh, slaves on the other. Um, to, among all the elements of traditional difference that profoundly challenged larger visions of human rights and equality for all gender stand out, stands out in striking clarity. Uh, we refer to uh, efforts in the, with the, in the, during the French Revolution. Um, and then of course, our successful efforts like Olympe de Gouges, one who was very inspirational, but uh, as many uh, at the time ended up in the guillotine. Also, uh, slavery was a big issue uh, for centuries, men and women uh, discriminated against those that they considered as backward races or uh, racially inferior. It uh, starts with uh, the um, Aristotle, Aristotle writing on, on the natural slavery, um, and then it extends all over to the 18th century where such theories were used to legitimize slave trade, uh, con con conquest, and of course, uh, um, colonial exploitation. Uh, there was obvious, obviously a disparity between the pronunciation that all men are created equal and the institution of slavery, and that led to further discussions on both sides of the Atlantic also. In addition to discussions, it led to revolutions, the most famous example being the Haitian Hi Revolution, that led to the first um, the, 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 the revolution in Saint Domingue, the French colony, that led to the independence of Haiti. These are briefly discussed in uh, in the report. And then we go to the 20th century. The 20th century is about the United Nations and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is, a, of course, a milestone in our development. Um, the story includes the two world wars. It doesn't, of course, uh, addresses the world wars per se, but rather the policy environment and uh, how the human rights framework was uh, uh, addressed uh, around it. Uh, the bloodsheds um, shook both the bloodsheds in both the wars, shook the world. Um, it uh, did, many people did draw the obvious conclusion that some kind of mutual understanding, some kind of mutual cooperation is necessary if humanity is going to prevent its own self-destruction. Uh, after the First World War, uh, quite significant was this text of the 14 points by the then president of the United States, Woodrow Wilson. His last point, the 14th point, was about creating an organization, a universal organization, an international organization to promote peace. That happened, although many of the other 14 points of Wilson didn't materialize, this one did. Uh, the League of Nations was created. The League of Nations was uh, not successful. Uh, it was, uh, it had, let's say, limited successes and many failures. Uh, it was mainly problematic from the, its very inception because of lack of participation. You can see on the right hand side, the uh, comic here is about uh, the US isolationist policies. Um, you see the brick that. Um, is missing from, uh, from, from the bridge of the League of Nations. Uh, in an ironic way, because Wilson, World War Wilson, the president, was instrumental in uh, bringing the League of Nations, in a rather ironic way, the United States did, never ratified uh, the, the League, never became a member. Uh, it was not the only absentee. Germany was not a member of the of the League of Nations either, because of uh, it was considered as the main aggressor in the United and the First World War, and was not invited. It was an outcast in the international community, and uh, of course the Soviet Union was also not invited, because after the uh, revolution in uh, in, uh, in Russia, the Bolshevik Revolution, um, it was also let's uh, say that uh, the new ideas of Lenin's socialism were not um, particularly appealing to the rest of the world and uh, they were also considered an outcast of the international community. Uh, Germany was in, uh, eventually invited, but things were rapidly changing after Hitler became uh, in power. He called for a referendum to vote to whether they should remain to the League of Nations. A vast 95% voted that they should leave. And then of course the Second World War started 
uh, even more terrible. We don't go over there. This is a symbolic photo of the end of the of the ending of the of the world war. What we do focus though is uh, the policy uh, development during the Second World War. They started very very early. This is uh, from uh, the first day of 1942, still in the midst of, in the middle of the war, maybe even in the beginning for in some analysis. Uh, we have uh, uh, this signing of the declaration by United Nations. So what this actually is, uh, is the ratification of the, of the UN Charter, um, an, an agreement uh, between uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who was the president of uh, the United States and uh, uh, the UK prime minister, uh, about the post-World War uh, world order. On the first day of 1942, 20 representatives from 26 countries, they signed this, uh, this uh, charter, uh, the declaration by United Nations with uh, the term United Nations used uh, for the first time, you know, in, uh, let's say, to replace the term associated powers that was used during the first uh, world war. Many meetings took place during the, the Second World War. I will briefly name that uh, on the left-hand side is the Moscow meeting. On the right-hand side, the dump out of and of course, the, in the middle is the famous Yalta meetings. All of them, all of them uh, refer to the need to create a new international organization that would uh, promote international cooperation. And they did, uh, the Yalta, the Yalta in, in Yalta, it was decided that a meeting would be called on some, in San Francisco on the 25th of April, 1945, to do to prepare the start of such an organization. In the middle time, in the in the mid time, as you can see in this picture here, Roosevelt is already quite old. Actually, 15 days before the uh, San Francisco conference, he died, and he was succeeded by by Truman. Um, the conference did take place, despite that fact. Um, it was, of course, a very very big conference. Uh, although only 50 nations at the time were ever presented. Still, there were 5,000 documents, many technical committees, commissions, etc. And they did manage to adopt the Charter of the United Nations. On the 24th of October, um, 1945, the first UN General Assembly took place in the next year in London. Human right, uh, rights references, uh, we addressed those references in the UN Charter. There are, I think, seven of them, seven human right, uh, rights references. They do lack precision. They are rather vague. Um, there is, of course, no co co concrete discussions on civil and political rights or social and economic ones, as the distinction was made later. Um, and those that are familiar with policy documents can see that uh, there is a relatively soft language used, such as encouraging or promoting human rights in the document. One of the uh, developments that are, of, uh, that are very important in our storytelling is, of course, the establishment of the, human, uh, of the Commission of Human Rights that took place under the ECOSOC, the Economic and Social Committee, one of the six principal organs of the UN system. Um, in the first, in the second uh, meeting, the Human Rights Commission, the Human Rights Commission started working towards uh, uh, a declaration of human rights. They established the drafting committee. We do offer a little bit of intellectual history on the specific personalities that had the almost impossible, the very difficult task of drafting the, the declaration. We do uh, refer to criticism at the time, such as uh, the quite famous criticism by the American Anthropological Association that basically was a stern effect. Uh, defense of uh, cultural relativism and basically said that it would be impossible to formulate a universal declaration. Uh, since then, of course, their position changed. Um, I'm not gonna go into the, any detail about the specific uh, people. I'm gonna go reflect on some inherent problems at the time of uh, the declaration, uh, the declaration's um, adoption. The main, one of the main problems is that of course, very few countries were represented and uh, the continent of Africa is the most glaring example of that. You can see that as this uh, map shows here, only four countries were actually represented. 
the scramble of Africa, which was the colonizing uh, effort, the colonizing of Africa in the late uh, 19th century, only left a couple of countries unaffect, un, un, uh, unaffected. One of them is Egypt that became independent in the early 1920s, uh, Ethiopia, uh, that was never uh, a colony, although it was briefly occupied by Italy during the Second World War, and uh, Liberia, which due to its status was never uh, also a colony, and South Africa, which was not very representative of Africa as it was on the verge of, um, of apartheid at the moment. Um, Despite uh, this problem, they had additional challenges uh, uh, with the emergence of the so Soviet uh, Union under a Marxist ideology, and of course, the Soviet bloc, the Eastern bloc, a group of uh, socialist uh, states uh, that would uh, uh, create various conflicts. We mainly focus on the theoretical part of the discussion, the theoretical uh, part of understanding of rights, which mainly involved the Marxist understanding of rights uh, as. Um, uh, group-based, the group-based understanding of rights rather than individual affirmations. Uh, the report goes at length discussing this. What uh, is important uh, for this presentation is that uh, the, the declaration was finalized in a remarkable, uh, in a remarkably small amount of time, in less than two years, which is inconceivable in terms of modern international diplomacy. Its structure and the content, every single article was negotiated at length and it was voted upon. And uh, I will, I have just here one, the first article, just to give an example of the, the length of the discussion, the, the, the points that they were discussed. The first article of the declaration says that all human beings are born free and equal, equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in the spirit of brotherhood. Now, the initial draft of the article said all men, reflecting the earlier declarations, like the uh, US Declaration of Independence, uh, it was replaced by all human beings uh, following uh, uh, different uh, remarks, including by the Indian representative uh, Mehta that you can see in the picture. Also, the term conscience was, was used uh, uh, after uh, the vice president of the committee uh, suggested a reflecting the Confucian, the Confucian principle of Zen, which is in the other picture. Uh, that, that just as an example, all of the uh, declaration was uh, approved on the 10th of December, 1948, which is Human Rights Day since then, uh, with 48 votes in favor and zero against and eight abstentions. We briefly discuss the uh, problems, the concerns and disagreements. The abstentions were basically Saudi Arabia, South Africa, and six abstentions from the Soviet bloc. I will not go into detail about the abstentions. I will maybe oversimplifying things a bit. I will say that uh, South Africa, which, who was, which was on the verge of the apartheid, as I said, did abstain because of what the declaration said. The Soviet bloc, maybe oversimplifying things, did abstain because of what the declaration did not say, and Saudi Arabia on uh, religious grounds on some of the articles. Now, there is uh, indeed uh, a full uh, presentation of uh, the declaration and of all of the 30 rights involved there. I will not go into detail, of course, on this. I will just say that uh, the social and economic rights that uh, not only the social group of countries, also many NGOs promoted uh, rigorously during the negotiations. Some of them were included. Uh, it's mainly rights 22 to 27 that uh, address social security, uh, desirable employment, equal pay for equal work, the right to rest, the right to leisure, uh, the right for adequate living standards, or the right to, the right to security. And now this brings me to the ending of my presentation. The first part of the report ends with the Universal Declaration. Now, there are a lot of reasons why we chose the first part to end here. The main reason is that uh, although it was a celebratory moment in the human rights uh, movement, not much happened after that. Not much happened after 1948, immediately after 1948. The pace, the pace of the negotiations slowed down considerably. It took almost um, two decades for the two covenants 
to be established on the based on the Universal Declaration, so that these human rights are actually become international law. It took three decades for uh, these uh, rights to become international law. We had to split the Universal Declaration into two covenants, one to address political rights, one to, ad to address social and economic rights in order to be able to agree on them. But then, uh, in a very complex environment where the UN totally changed, with uh, the membership totally changing, with new countries after the anti-colonialism movement uh, su successfully uh, creating new independent countries, the whole environment in the United Nations changed. And it was also quite politically complex, quite uh, due to the Cold War, quite complicated. So all of these notions will go into the second part that will address also the very complex policy framework that was created with numerous treaties on human rights, uh, dozens of treaties on human rights, and their enthronement basically after the 1970s in, uh, in, the, in the arena. Uh, I will say, concluding uh, my, my presentation here, that the report is indeed celebratory of human rights. Uh, there is criticism on that, of course. One can conceive of maybe more radical frameworks for promoting the, uh, a more just world. But uh, I, will, I, I will say that if successfully implementing the human rights framework, uh, the world would definitely be a better place. Um, the current human rights framework, the, 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 the human rights framework that we do have right now, um, it would also help to avert existential threats. Uh, it's now almost 75 years since the United Nations were created, but we can see that recent developments indicate that even full-scale world wars are not out, out, of, out of the equation. They are not out of the equation. So the need to promote uh, the human rights is there. The need to link them with the environmental, the environmental sustainability framework is also there because the environmental arena also poses existential threats in the form, uh, form of environmental degradation and climate change. So I will, uh, think I will now pass it uh, to Elsa to explain uh, to us a little bit more about the universal uh, environmental rights. And uh, hopefully I will see you after that. Stop sir. Okay. So now that I managed to share my screen, hello everybody. My name is Elsa Tumani. I'm a Marie Curie Fellow at the University of uh, Trento in Italy, and I'm collaborating with the Institute uh, on this project. Um, I'm going to present uh, on the global law and policy of uh, environmental rights. And uh, when I talk about uh, global law and policy, uh, I refer to all possible levels. Uh, of uh, action, so both national, regional, and international law and policy. And uh, I also refer to the current and potential interactions. Obviously, I cannot cover everything in this uh, introdu introductory presentation, uh, but uh, in very general terms, when we talk about uh, environmental rights in law, we would look for provisions in national constitutions or other high-level domestic legislation, provisions in human rights instruments, 
at the regional and international uh, level, and uh, the case law of judicial bodies in all these three levels. So I will present a snapshot of the general picture and uh, will provide some detail on some pieces of this uh, puzzle. So what we mean when we talk about environmental rights, and let's start from a very general uh, conceptualization. Uh, first, we imply that uh, citizens, either individually or in groups, may be involved uh, in pursuing what is generally considered to be a public good, a public interest, in this case, environmental protection. Environmental rights can be categorized into procedural rights, which involve uh, access to information, participation to decision making, and access to justice, and substantive rights. Uh, substantive uh, rights are generally concern the state of the environment as such, as, and the state of uh, natural uh, resources. Uh, as uh, the, de the degradation of the environment and of natural uh, resources imply a violation of uh, several, let's say, traditional human rights, such as the right uh, to life and the right uh, to health. And uh, these substantive rights may refer to both uh, current and future generations. Uh, substantive environmental rights uh, may include uh, more novel rights, which are generally considered uh, to be collective uh, rights of particular uh, group, groups of people which enjoy a special relationship with the land and uh, natural resources. Such rights, uh, for instance, uh, involve uh, territorial rights and uh, uh, rights to the use of natural resources by indigenous peoples and the rights to land and to seeds for peasants and the smallholder farmers in general, as I will explain briefly a bit later. The right to plow informed consent is a particular right as it connects procedural and substantive rights. It refers to the right of indigenous peoples and local communities to consent to developments affecting their environment and their livelihoods. Uh, these rights uh, have been developed progressively within the global framework, the most uh, novel development being the rights of uh, nature. Uh, just to give you an idea, as I'm not uh, going uh, to, to talk about the rights of nature uh, today, uh, this development refers uh, to a new generation of environmental laws uh, that um, uh, rather than that uh, moves beyond uh, from uh, granting rights to humans and uh, grants legal rights uh, to nature itself, uh, together with enforcement rights to affected uh, communities. Uh, so this development marks a move uh, from uh, the human right to environment to the rights of nature and arguably for a more um, anthropocentric uh, towards a more eco ecocentric approach uh, to environmental uh, law and uh, policy. Uh, a bit of history, how it all started. Uh, the Stockholm Declaration uh, on the Human Environment, uh, adopted by the UN Conference on the Human Environment, uh, held in Stockholm uh, in uh, 1972, is uh, considered uh, to be the point of uh, departure. Uh, it is to be noted, uh, apart from the sexism in language, I mean, it seems the Indian representative uh, was gone by the time and uh, the others were not alert enough. Uh, that the principle does not recognize uh, the human right to environment as such. It rather recognizes the link between fundamental uh, rights and environmental protection. It thus amounts to an indirect recognition of uh, the right to environment. In fact, uh, the Stockholm Declaration built on earlier language contained in the 1966 uh, UN uh, International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights which uh, recognized the individual's right to the continuous improvement of living conditions, as well as to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, and committed states to protecting the right to health by positive measures, including through the improvement of all aspects of environmental and industrial hygiene. The Stockholm Declaration inspired many national constitutions uh, developed in the 70s, and initiated the debate on a human right to the environment, but has not given rise to a binding rule of international law. In fact, uh, linking human rights with environmental protection remained hugely controversial in the global arena. 
Uh, in uh, 1992, the UN Conference on Environment and Development did not manage to reach consensus on an explicit recognition of a human right to the rural environment, resu resulting in an arguably watered-down formulation, making reference to the anthropocentric nature of environmental protection and the related entitlement of humans to live in harmony with nature. On the other hand, the Rio Declaration also contained the first explicit recognition of procedural environmental rights, access to information, participation, decision making, and access to justice in environmental matters. Although not binding per se, Principle 10 has served as an international benchmark uh, guiding the development of uh, procedural environmental rights, uh, which may be granted to individuals by international law and uh, which can be exercised either at the national or even at the international level. Its influence uh, can also be traced in uh, certain provisions in multilateral uh, environmental agreements, which are binding instruments, including, for instance, the Convention on Biological Diversity and its uh, Cartagena Protocol on uh, Biosafety. Uh, principle 10 has further induced uh, legal developments at the regional level, including the Aarhus Convention and uh, more recently the Escazú Agreement. Uh, so to date, uh, the Aarhus uh, Convention uh, is the most far-reaching and detailed environmental treaty on procedural uh, environmental rights. Uh, together with its protocol on pollutant release and transfer releases and uh, the Escazú Agreement, uh, that I will address next. Uh, they are the only legally binding international instruments that put uh, principle 10 of the Rio Declaration uh, into practice. Adopted in the framework of the UN Eco Economic Commission uh, for Europe, but open for ratification uh, to all UN member states, the Aarhus Convention is a multilateral environmental agreement that takes a rights-based approach uh, to environmental protection links environmental and human rights, as well as government accountability and uh, intergenerational equity by awarding procedural rights to members of the public. Uh, the convention provides for the right of everyone to have access in environmental information that is held by public authorities, uh, the right uh, to participate uh, in environmental uh, decision making, and the right of access to justice with regard to decisions that appear to have contravened environmental law. It specifically requires parties to inform the public consent early in the decision-making process of proposed activities which are listed in Annex 1 of the Convention and other activities which may have a significant effect on the environment and uh, to ensure early public participation in decision-making. Uh, one of the most advanced uh, features of the Aarhus Convention is its uh, Compliance Committee, which was established in uh, 2002. Uh, the committee considers any submission uh, brought before it by parties, the Secretariat, and importantly, members of the public. Uh, this uh, way, the Convention goes way beyond other international environmental agreements in providing access to a review procedure for members of the public. Uh, the committee adopts independent findings of non-compliance and may recommend measures to be taken uh, by the non-compliant states. Upon uh, the committee's recommendation, the meeting uh, of the parties to the Aarhus Convention may decide uh, upon any appropriate uh, measures to bring about full compliance uh, with the convention. It may provide uh, advice or assistance, uh, make recommendations or issue declarations of uh, non-compliance or cautions. Although the Convention has no enforcement mechanism against a failing party, uh, decisions on compliance are used to accept uh, political pressure on the failing state and uh, could also be used as additional argumentation in domestic and uh, regional uh, judicial procedures. Uh, for example, the EU policies on uh, renewable energy, particularly with regard to wind energy, have given rise to a series of cases uh, before the Compliance Committee. Uh, for instance, the committee has found uh, the UK in non-compliance for violation of the Convention's provisions on public participation, as the UK National Renewable Energy Plan was approved in fast-track manner and was not subject to public participation. 
The much more recent Escazu agreement was adopted in 2018 under the auspices of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, the Escazu agreement includes the same three pillars as the Arcus Convention, so access to information, participation, decision making, and access to justice. Importantly, however, it is the first legally binding instrument in the world to include provisions on environmental human, right, uh, human rights defenders. And this is crucial because um, according to reports uh, by Global Witness, for instance, the most dangerous countries for environmental def defenders uh, in the world are currently Colombia, Brazil, Mexico, Guatemala, and Honduras. Uh, so the Escazú agreement aims um, not only to offer legal tools to citizens to hold governments accountable, but also hope in the face of increasing intimidation, harassment, and murders of uh, environmental defenders in the region. At the same time, and uh, to move away from procedural rights towards a substantive environmental rights, uh, the right to environment is uh, progressively enshrined uh, in constitutional provisions uh, around uh, the globe. The right uh, to a healthy environment is already formulated uh, with various phraseologies in more than 50 constitutions, while more than 150 constitutions recognize the link between uh, the state of the environment and the well being of uh, humankind, uh, either as a right or as a government uh, duty. Uh, when it comes to regional human rights uh, instruments, uh, the African Charter on uh, Human and People's uh, Rights uh, from 1981 already stated that all peoples shall have the right to a general satisfactory environment favorable to their development. Uh, while the additional uh, protocol on economic, social, and cultural rights to the American Convention on Human Rights contains a provision establishing both an individual right and a state obligation. Uh, the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, on the other hand, um, uh, contains no provision linking human rights and the environment. Uh, the European Court on Human Rights has instead developed a considerable case law linking environmental degradation with violations of rights already protected in the Convention, including the right to life, the right to property, the right to private and family life, and the right to an effective uh, remedy. In addition, in uh, September uh, 2021, some, a couple of months ago, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe has recommended an additional protocol to the European Convention on Human Rights on the right to environment. Uh, when it comes to the international uh, level, the UN uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was the first uh, instrument uh, to recognize environmental rights for a particular category indigenous peoples around the globe. Uh, the rationale is linked uh, broadly uh, to the right uh, to self-determination in a post-colonial context, uh, their dependence on natural uh, resources, their close uh, cultural relationship with their territories, as well as the more utilitarian argument, um, their customary conservation uh, practices which have good environmental outcomes. Although it is non-binding, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is considered to, con to codify a binding international law of relevance to Indigenous peoples, and uh, arguably it is part of uh, customary international law. Uh, the much uh, more recent uh, UN Declaration on the Rights of Peasants is a particularly novel international instrument uh, because it takes uh, a comprehensive uh, substantive approach regarding both existing and new rights for uh, peasants and rural populations uh, in general. It also links these rights to their contribution to global food security and to their relationship with land, land seed, and uh, natural resources. For instance, when it comes to seed, uh, which is a particularly controversial topic in international uh, law currently due, due to the linkages both to the conservation of agricultural biodiversity, but also to intellectual property rights and other uh, trade-related policies. Uh, the UN Declaration on the Rights of uh, Peasants establishes uh, seed rights for peasants and other people working in rural areas, accompanied by a range of obligations for states including measures to respect, protect, and fulfill the right to seeds, 
recognize peasants' rights to rely on their own seeds and to decide on the crops they wish to grow and support uh, peasant seed systems. Uh, the UN resolution on the right uh, to a clean, healthy and sustainable environment uh, now is the first one to establish the right to environment for all. Um, the resolution also acknowledges the damage inflicted by climate change and environmental destruction on millions of people across uh, the world and uh, underlines that the most uh, vulnerable segments of the population are uh, more acutely impacted. While not legally binding, its value should not be underestimated. Uh, the resolution supports the idea that the right to environment should be universally protected and could bolster efforts for, small, for uh, formal recognition by others, for instance, the Council of Europe or by states that have not done so already. Uh, but more importantly, it provides an additional tool to challenge state and corporate actors for failing to take prompt and uh, adequate action to address uh, the triple environmental challenges of climate change, pollution, and uh, biodiversity loss. And why this is important? Um, because uh, court uh, battles invoking the right to a healthy environment, uh, particularly the climate uh, context, are already frequent and may become even more so. Uh, as an illustration, there has been a dramatic increase in use of domestic litigation in the last few years, as uh, citizens uh, look uh, for uh, avenues to hold the national governments accountable in relation to climate commitments. When we talk about uh, climate uh, litigation, we talk about judicial uh, cases usually relating to climate-related human rights, uh, domestic enforcement of international commitments, keeping fossil fuels in the ground, and uh, corporate liability and responsibility. And there is every reason uh, to expect uh, rising filings and decisions in uh, 2022 in the context of international law developments, such as the adoption of uh, the UN Resolution on the Human Rights Environment. Uh, but just to note that uh, this case law is already massive and truly global. So a couple of illustrations um, amongst uh, the most important victories, let's say, of the climate uh, movement. So in Urgenta, the Dutch uh, Supreme Court uh, found an obligation of the Dutch uh, government to reduce carbon emissions in line with its human rights obligations, noting that the European Convention on Human Rights protects the rights to life, private and family life from the threat of uh, climate change. In another landmark uh, case, uh, Royal Dutch uh, Shell, uh, the Hague uh, District uh, Court uh, ordered Shell to reduce its emissions by 45% by 2030 in relation to 2019 across all activities, including its subsidiaries and both its own emissions and end use emissions, and even made its decision uh, provisionally enforceable. Uh, this decision marks uh, the first time that the company was held responsible for mitigating climate change in accordance uh, with uh, the commitments made by a state at the international level. Uh, in the US, a federal uh, judge um, invalidated uh, the Department of Interior's uh, decision to offer 80 million acres in the Gulf of Mexico for oil and gas uh, leasing. Uh, arguing that uh, the interior failed to accurately disclose and consider the greenhouse gas emissions that will result from the lease uh, sale, thus violating a bedrock environmental law. So just to highlight uh, some general trends, and I'm, I will leave it at that, uh, I believe we witness uh, the results of increased uh, societal awareness when it comes to environmental risk. And this awareness is uh, finally reflected uh, on law and governance, at least uh, segments of it. Uh, this awareness is expressed uh, through increased public participation in environmental matters, both through protest and advocacy, and through legal and judicial action. And is reflected in uh, both a human rights term in uh, climate uh, action, and in a larger trend uh, towards environmental sustainability in the human rights machinery. And with this, I stop. Thank you very much.
Let me stop sharing my screen. And uh, I don't know if we have any questions. Uh, otherwise, let me just uh, say that um, uh, this was the first in a series of seminars and uh, the schedule of the following ones uh, will be announced uh, in the project uh, website. Uh, in addition, all relevant material uh, and uh, presentations uh, will be uploaded uh, uh, on the website uh, together with the draft, draft report um, on the evolution of the human rights uh, framework that uh, Asterios uh, was presenting. Okay, I'm going to leave the floor, give the floor to Asterios. <laughs> Uh, hello again. No, I don't have uh, much to add, to be honest. Uh, uh, that's it. If there are no questions, we'll be uh, happy uh, to hear from you uh, in our website, which is included in the poster uh, for this seminar. And of course, in the next uh, four uh, seminars, which will be addressing uh, specific aspects of uh, environmental rights, starting with uh, the first seminar on the relationship between uh, human rights and uh, the conservation and sustainable use of uh, biological diversity. So thank you all for attending. Uh, I'll, uh, uh, thank you all for attending our first webinar and I uh, hope you stay around and uh, see you soon. Bye. <laughs>